So, Gies, you mentioned uh, in the mechanisms of failure, problems with stiffness, arthrofibrosis, and malalignment and malrotation. How often, or when would you recommend that we uh, really look carefully at rotation of the components when considering a revision? Well, as, I, as I tried to tell you, the uh, new paper which came from the Scandinavian group about the threshold, the two things I think that are important, first of all, is stiffness itself, of course, is probably in some of these cases with malalignment, a more a problem of the knee which has never been good from the beginning. And if you look at the threshold of actual malrotation, probably you look for a neutral position of the, of the tibia and a neutral position of the femur, which is still acceptable. If you have an internal rotation combined with the stiffness, then the question is, because that's what we found in our prospective database, unfortunately, if you revise them, they become better but it will never become as good as an aseptic one. So what we are looking at now is the question, can you first, question is, do you need to revise them more early? Yeah, so now we wait just for two years and see whether it becomes better. Or is there still a matter of debate whether this slight internal rotation of a femoral component is not the reason for the stiffness? The answer is I don't know. So what's your threshold uh, for revising Threshold is internal component. rotation. So what I do, I make a CT scan. I try to, to, to state out in the, in the paper, I always look at the clinic. So if there's an internal rotation of the tibial component and the patient comes in and he says, from the beginning, my foot is, is in external rotation, then probably there's a, there's a link between the clinic and the CT scan. And that's what I look for. I don't look for, because if you look at these CT scans, you can always find one or two degrees of malrotation, so to say, which give you probably the reason to revise, but they won't become that much better. And I'm, maybe some of the other panel members have other ideas. Ferris? You always have ideas. No, I mean, I, I, th I think it's interesting. As we learn to measure more, and as we get the capacity to do CT-based measurements, we're going to fall into the trap of thinking that by making the numbers look right, we're going to make that knee better. And the reality, I, I, think we, I think we agree on this, is that a lot of the time it's a soft tissue disease. It's a problem. They get arthrofibrosis because of the way their tissues respond. And you can revise them as often as you like, and you can get the numbers perfect. It won't happen. So there is, I, I agree with everything you said, but I would counsel very carefully against promising these guys a good outcome because I don't, I don't think you can at the moment. And just because we can measure a little bit of malrotation, it doesn't mean that's exactly the cause of their problem. So let's forget about rotation for a minute and talk specifically about arthrofibrosis, knowing that the results are not always predictable. So what sort of patient do you offer surgery to when they come in unhappy with their range of motion, but they have no pain? So maybe Matt? I, uh, I agree with the previous two speakers, particularly Professor Haddad. We've uh, looked at a large prospective cohort of patients and looked at their genes in my lab, and those patients who have true arthrofibrosis. So there's a marked difference between stiffness and arthrofibrosis. So well-fixed, well-aligned total knees and have arthrofibrosis, there is, we've identified 17 genes involved in that process. So that patient, I mean, that's the real key. Can we identify those patients who have recurrent arthrofibrosis and the patient factors are contributing to that? We don't have the answer to that now, but we suspect that. In my hands, the patient who has a pain-free knee is a very difficult decision to revise for range of motion. Uh, if they have gross malalignment or other issues of the knee replacement that I can take care of and I think I can help them, I'll consider it. But it's uh, very difficult for me to revise a stiff patient who's pain-free. So what if they have a flexion deformity? They come in with a 30-degree flexion deformity, and they've can flex to 70 degrees, compared to somebody who comes in with a 5-degree flexion deformity and flex can flex to 60 degrees. Yeah, that's a great question, because that highlights the patient expectations. So someone with a severe stiffness is markedly different than someone who's got 5 degrees lacking extension and maybe can't get to 130 degrees. So the threshold does change for those who are more limited with basic activities, such as walking or stairs. Yes. Well, we, we looked at the stiff knees, and I am completely agree. If you, if you look at our prospective data, it's very simple. Th 20 to 30 degrees improvement of the range of motion. 
Mainly, if you have an extension deficit, you can improve it, but the pain score will reduce 50%. So it means that if they start off with a VAS score of six, they still have a pain of three. And even worse, if they are over eight, you will improve something, but they will never be without pain. And you have to tell them that in front. I think mechanically, you can gain so much more by addressing an extension deficit than by promising someone more flexion. That's, you know, that, that's the big thing. I think promising people more flexion. But there's more. I mean, I, I'm not sure we're always doing the right operation because we always try and stay conservative with these cases. But this may be the time to do the hinge. It may be the time to really go sloppy. Pierre? Uh, and, uh, you know, I think you, you have to look at your strategy on an individual patient basis. Yeah, I think the whole problem of uh, the painful uh, total knee uh, is probably not just mechanics and... Uh, you know, like you point out, uh, arthrofibrosis in genes. There's also a big push towards leptin, leptin contents. Uh, people with uh, obese people with high uh, leptin concentrations in their synovial fluid tend to have more pain. And there is also the, the problem of smokers. Smokers tend to have more pain than the non-smokers. So there's various uh, and many, many factors that, uh, that play, and not just, you know, the rotation or the virus in the valgus. It's worth saying, although we all know it, uh, it's, you can't cure unhappiness with surgery. So a lot of these patients, a lot of total knee patients, just don't have the psychometric profile that's compatible with a good outcome. And you can't cure that with surgery. That's a, that's a huge, huge issue. And that's not, let's not get carried away with the mechanics, the genes, and everything else. There is a huge issue here around patient selection and around working out. If you get it wrong the first time, Actually, getting it wrong the second time is not necessarily a good thing. That's absolutely correct. Mauricio, you have a comment? I'd like to raise a question for the panel. Uh, first, I believe that uh, the, the satisfaction of the patient has to do with his previous uh, expectation. This has a lot to do, and it's important to address this very carefully before. I'd like to ask you, how much do you believe that the preoperative range of motion impacts the postoperative results? Because I've seen in the literature that at the end, the majority of the patients uh, end up with the range of motion very close to the preoperative range of motion. And it has nothing to do with the mobile, bio, uh, mobile bearings or with the technique at all. I'd like to raise this question to the panel. And I think if the patient's attitude towards physiotherapy is good, and pain threshold is reasonable, he should be able to regain the range of motion. If the pain threshold is bad, then he's unlikely to do physiotherapy and the range of motion will not improve. That is my thinking. I don't know if I may be right or wrong. Well, I agree with you that uh, a lot of long-term studies have shown no difference between manipulation or no manipulation at the long term. The reason we do manipulation, even though physiotherapy can accomplish the same thing, is that in, in, in many places, doing a manipulation is actually cheaper than increasing physiotherapy for a long period of time because physiotherapy isn't cheap. That's why I do it because it costs my patients $60 per session for physiotherapy if they have to do it five days a week. That's a lot of money. But a manipulation for them is free, not necessarily for the system. I mean, I think... I, I, and it's also, for, for me, it's, it's a little more humane to give them that more rapid range of motion, to give them that confidence so that they can rehab a little bit better. I, I think you have patients who will, are reluctant to move who are going to be a problem regardless of what you do. I have to say, when we manipulate a knee, they will always have been through a rehab program. They'll always have been through physiotherapy. And quite frankly, I disagree with you. It's a mechanical block. You put that knee in the OR. It's not like that person who suddenly flexes because they're asleep. It's a mechanical block. You have to work quite hard to get it moving. If it wasn't for that, then they would move with physio. But those guys, I don't think, will move even if you've got physios with big hands working all day, every day. They're, they're stuck. Our own hospital. Eh? So I'll, I'll ask the, the physiotherapy in my hospital to take a look at the patient to see what they actually did in the first six weeks post-op. Because sometimes, unfortunately, as we all know, we lose track of the patient who we send out after surgery, and sometimes there's a lot to gain. And Hi. Question? Hi. Uh, uh, Burak Beksaj from Istanbul. Uh, sorry, do you mind there's somebody behind you first, and then you? You can okay. stay. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is uh, that has anyone tried uh, quadriceps plasty in a situation where your range of motion is poor? 
And if, you, if so, uh, what's the best time to do it? I mean, you found post-op that you don't have adequate range of motion. Now you'll be thinking about a cordyceps plasty, or you don't. I don't. I've tried it twice, and you lose uh, active extension. So I stopped doing it. I think it's a lost art. It's, it's an operation I was taught by one of my mentors, and you see it very rarely done. And it's, you have to go a long way up in order to release it and not lose much strength. And it's best done when everything is settled a long time later, as I said before. I think it has a role. I have to say we've used it more for stiff knees in young people post-trauma uh, rather than post-knee arthroplasty. And it does work. The reality is you've got some knees that are stuck, and you do a quadriceps plasty, and you get a good range back. But it's not a straightforward mini incision operation, and uh, I think most people don't know how to do it anymore. Hi, uh, Burak Beksaj from uh, Turkey, Istanbul. I'd like to ask the panel if they use any uh, injection techniques uh, for a stiff knee uh, before they manipulate or after they manipulate, do they inject the knee with steroids and local anesthetics? I tried to, in the clinic, inject the knee, fill the knee up with a lot of local anesthetic, and I tried to try to get some more range of motion in the office. Despite me being very patient, and Ferris knows I'm not that patient, but you know, walking outside the room, seeing a few more patients coming back and trying to be very gentle, push it, I've always resorted to taking those patients back to the OR and doing a general anesthetic, and that's why I stopped doing it and just say, okay, next slate, just do them before I start my slate and do the manipulation. I don't inject them post-op with any steroids because I'm concerned about the steroids and the implant and the risk of infection, so I haven't been doing it. So this is, uh, we've moved away from peripheral nerve blocks to particulars for primaries and revisions, but this is one case where we do a, a nerve block, and so we take them, as Prof. Dad pointed out, into the operating room, full general anesthesia, full muscle relaxation, slow, gradual, I usually tell my residents, hand at the tibial tubercle, that makes sure they don't deviate to the lever arm. And then these patients, I'll admit overnight, with the nerve block, maybe two nights, and it's one of the very few times I use a CPM when they're not getting range of motion therapy from the therapist. I prefer to stay away from the CPM because it takes away their activity from doing it and doesn't allow them to get fully straight or bent to their potential. But this is one case I admit them for 36 to 48 hours, and they have four sessions of therapy with CPM in the intervening time point and the nerve block running. I think we do something pretty similar. I think whether you do it periarticular or whether you do it with a nerve block, you've got to get them pain relief at the time. I think what your question alludes to is that there have been, there've been presentations over the last decade, both from Leo Whiteside and Chit Ranawat, talking about corticosteroid injection with local anesthetic into the knee around the time of manipulation. And I have to say, it intuitively sounds like a nice idea. We, we don't have any experience or data on that, so I can't help you. But I know both Chit and Leah have talked about that quite a lot. Any other questions? Well, can I have the computer on uh, the projection on the laptop, please? Yep, yeah, that's one. So Matt sent this case. So this is a 51-year-old uh, woman with progressively worsening left knee pain with a history of infantile blounts. She's had multiple osteotomies, 17 in total, and had an epiphysiodesis of the contralateral right leg. She had a right knee replacement uh, about a year prior, progressively worsening left knee pain on her opposite side. She's, I presume that she was happy with the right knee. She's got a BMI of 61. Uh, cholecystectomy, ruptured colon hernia, hysterectomy, anxiety, OSA, on disability, uh, she takes antidepressants and she takes Ativan. So how many in the audience have seen some red flags right now, so far? About 10. She's got so, more than three allergies. That's, yeah, so the, to me, that's a, that's a very serious sign. Anyone with more than three allergies is one for my This partner. actually has been documented in a, in a study that I've seen. People with more than three allergies tend to do poorly with a knee replacement. Um, so let, I'll, I'll talk about obesity later. 
So she's got a range of motion from zero to 90 degrees, more than 10 millimeters opening medial and lateral, negative anterior posterior drawer, left hip is fine, Neuro uh, neurological examination is fine, and these are her x-rays. So who, who in the panel would be keen on doing a knee replacement on this patient? From a radi radiological perspective, I would be, uh, well, I would not have a problem with it, but with the patient itself, it, it's a challenge. But unfortunately, she has a reason why she has pain, huh? so that's a different debate. So what about the patient with the BMI of over 60? Does anybody have, I'm, I'll, I'll give you my disclosures, anybody who comes to me with a BMI over 45, I spend a lot of time with them telling them that they have a life-threatening illness, that's not osteoarthritis. That's their BMI of over 45. They need to get that treated. They need to get that managed. Otherwise, they're not getting it totally from me. They may get it from somebody else, but they ain't getting it from me. And do you send them to a surgeon who does a gastric bypass, or what do you do? You just send them back to the GP? No, I have the surgeon who does the bypass on my iPhone. <laughs> I send them a text message right away, and he's a, he agrees to see them right away. But more than 50% of those patients decline. They absolutely refuse. It's either because they have no insight or they're medicating their anxiety, depression, and other issues with their eating disorder or whatever. But, but that's not my problem. But if you look at the amount of osteoarthritis in this knee, probably if she would lose weight, the pain will definitely decrease. Correct. And, and having been in practice a while now, I used to do knee replacements on patients with a BMI of 60. I don't do it anymore. That's why my hair... In the picture you have in the program, I had a lot more hair, and it was not as white as it is now. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem is literature doesn't help us as much as it should, in that the data you can swing either way. Correct. Whereas the reality, if you do any number of knee replacements, you will admit that doing someone this size makes for a miserable morning or a miserable afternoon. So I, you know, I'm very happy to duck whenever I can, because it's a lot tougher than doing a standard case. And they, they, may, they may well do very, very well, but on balance, if anybody's going to get a complication, if anybody's going to get an infection, it's going to be them. That's at least my bias. Having said that, I'd like to hear other people's biases. She did fine with her other knee. Well, that's your problem. Your problem here yeah. is somebody did the other knee. And Correct. They, did, they, they chose carefully. They chose the right knee. And they, and they did a good job. <laughs> we have looked at our infection rates in uh, BMIs over 35 and they're about three times as elevated as uh, under 35. So it's a, it's, a huge, it's a huge risk. On the other hand, is she happy with her uh, right knee? And if so, then you can ask yourself, you can make her completely happy maybe. <laughs> Send her to Bass. I won't do it. We should poll the audience. I'd love to know how many people would offer a total knee. How many would do a total knee and send me to a BMI of 61? Forget the x-rays. Forget this particular patient. This man. No, two. 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 Three. Yeah. Now, I know, Matt, that at the Mayo Clinic, particularly Dave Lowell, has, has had experience with uh, so-called super obese, yeah. BMI over 50. So, uh, you know, this is a typical... BMI that we see. If I if I didn't see patients with a BMI of over 40, that would be over 50% of my practice because they're referred in. There's no question this is a problem. Dan Barry just reported that Close Knee Society uh, looking incrementally starting at BMI of 20 up to BMI of 60. And for each incremental increase in a BMI, there's a 16% increased risk of infection. So there's no question, at least in our internal data, that these are high-risk patients. In the hip, even worse, they have infections plus dislocations increasing exponentially, and the curve is quite predictable. It goes like this, and there's an exponential increase, and when you hit 40, the exponential curve is even higher. No risk, it's a high risk, no question it's a high risk games. The problem is these patients, when at least when I've sent them to the bariatric surgeon, as pointed out by Professor Mossery, most of them don't do anything with them. They come right back, and their patient satisfaction with the surgeon is, is beyond uh, frustrated especially when they've got a knee x-ray looking like this. May I ask you something for you? Uh, I'd like to present you a case. It's a, a lady. She's 62 years old. She's 150 kilos, and she's 1.50 meter tall. I mean, she's very short and very obese. 
I referred her to, a, to another doctor in order to get a bypass. She came back 50 kilos less, but it's still 100 kilos. And at the end, she had a type with 40 centimeters in length and a diameter of 75 centimeters. And she told me, well, okay, doctor, I lost 50 kilos, what now? I'd like to ask you again, because she's again above 50, the IMC, the ABMI. I mean, what to do with a patient that is compliant? I mean, she did her, uh, her task, and what to do with these patients? So if because she's, this is a very common problem to deal with obese patients in, in our current practice nowadays. But if, if she's 100 kilos, that's uh, 220 pounds. She's five foot nothing. Uh, she's 150 centimeters? Yeah, uh, 150. So that, that would be five feet. Her BMI would be about 40, 42. I don't think it would be 50. So because she went, she dropped her body mass by a third, clearly yeah. she did what she had to do, yeah. and clearly she's motivated to continue. I would then offer her surgery if she's, not, if she's having a lot of pain. But a lot of these patients, when they come back, okay. their pain is less, and they can afford to wait a little bit longer. But if, I'm, I'm if, if, if she does her part of the deal, I'll do my part yeah, of the deal. This is, my, this is what I'd like to do. Sometimes they are compliant. They do yeah. what they can, but even so, they are still obese, yeah. and what to do next? Yeah, it, all these patients remain obese. They don't, they don't become skinny all of a yeah, sudden. Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't happen. Okay. I think there's another issue here to factor in, which is that these are often fat, but they are metabolically not in good shape, even yeah. though they're big people. So it's really well worth them seeing a physician, getting their nutritional work up, even if they've lost a lot of weight and they've done all the right things, get them medically right before you do the operation because of the infection risk. I think a lot of them yeah. are metabolically deranged as a result of dramatic weight loss. You have to be very careful with them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and at our place, when they go for a bariatric surgery, it's not just seeing the surgeon, it's a whole team. They have to go through one year of nutritional counseling before they have the surgery. They have to try to lose weight the old-fashioned way. Then, then once they've established their, their eating habits, then they have the bypass and they continue the same eating habits with the same counseling and metabolic monitoring and so on. So it's, it's a long process. It's not just send them and... So looking at the x-rays here, uh, Mauricio, would you offer a total knee or would you be doing an osteotomy? Um, I would like to have a long-standing x-ray in order I thought, to have... I thought, you'd, I thought you'd ask, yeah, so yeah. there you go. Yeah, I would expect that. Uh, I would not go primarily for a total knee in this case. I would try to restore the alignment first and then maybe later on, but not primary uh, total knee in this case, in my hands at least. Uh, I've done a few cases of this uh, blount disease, and I use a, a customized implant uh, because it's a heavy patient. It's a bowing of the tibia, which is very difficult to apply if you uh, do a corrective osteotomy because it's relatively far away from the joint. And then you have to do all two operations. And, of course, if you look at the joint line itself, it's already not really, uh, let's say, neutral. So I would uh, order a uh, customized uh, tibial implant with a curve. And I do, uh, up till now, I did, uh, I think, something like five or six cases with it. And I know if it, I'll show you a clinical photo just to give you an idea what her alignment is, and I'll go back to this. So here's her clinical photo, and this is the knee we're talking about, I, I believe. So she looks reasonably aligned because of that zigzag deformity, and there are the x-rays. I still would be a little bit afraid of loosening if you do a primary. Mm. So, Ferris? So, I think this is at a borderline distance from the joint uh, for doing an intra, for, for doing a, a combined osteotomy. It's just a little bit far away for comfort. But I think it's just about close enough that uh, I would actually do it with a customized implant. So, we've done a lot of these. Where, but we've, we've done an osteotomy at the same time, bridged it with the stem and corrected the alignment and done the primary knee. So, that would be my choice but I could easily cope with someone staging this. Um, could you do it just because her overall clinical alignment looks good and the knee happens to be parallel to the ankle and just put a knee up there? I'd be a little bit worried about that on the basis of that, that, that stress going through that proximal tibia has got to be pretty high. I think you need some form of correction. Matt, any comments? It's your case, so... Yeah, so uh, we've, we've brought out some of the important points in this case. So one is, is her weight. Two is uh, the deformity there. 
and three is the multiple previous surgeries. So we haven't talked about the multiple 17 different surgeries. The soft tissue envelope was actually more concerning to me than the bone itself here. So, uh, you know, she had laxity that we pointed out on examination. If you go one forward on the, on the clinical slides, they're not showing up well, but you can see multiple transverse, horizontal, vertical, medial, lateral, and patellar incisions. So for me, it was more of a concern with the soft tissues externally and then the soft tissues in regards to the ligamentous status and balancing it internally. I veered away from doing two surgical interventions based upon that concept. Um, and then there's obviously the debate of whether we use patient-specific instrumentation, navigation, external alignment, uh, or a custom component. But for me, the most important thing was the soft tissue and healing in this obese female with multiple previous surgeries and poor skin bridges. As you can see here, this, these were our thoughts. She's a, a rather low demand patient. And uh, in my hands, I thought the best option was a primary total knee with nothing cute, just extra measure alignment. If you drop her plumb line, she was relatively well aligned down that, from the center of the head down to the center of the ankle because the deformity had corrected itself. So we can show them what we did. We opted for a, a primary total knee arthroplasty. And if you go to the next slide, you can, you can see the uh, alignment. So I used an inter intermedullary, extramedullary alignment. We thought that we had it perfectly well aligned. In my opinion, this patient, her number one failure would be malalignment of it. And the bone was, because of the previous surgery, was sclerotic. I had a good rim, we had good bleeding, and we had it very well aligned with a single procedure that we were able to do expeditiously for this obese patient who is at a high risk for infection and soft tissue issues. Certainly you could make an argument that you would need additional tibial fixation, but for me saving this lady three hours on the operating room table and getting it perfectly aligned and balanced, I thought was a better part of Valor. And what are these screws here? That's you a, put an autograph? Great. Yeah, so uh, the options here, there's no autograph there. Initially, because of the same concerns everybody had with the tibial fixation, I was going to do a primary cone, as we saw in my talk earlier today. The problem with the cone there is it was going to sacrifice cortical bone down in the metadiaphyseal junction in the previous osteotomy area. So I needed some what we call traditional rebar. I needed some fixation there in the posterior medial area. And instead of doing a cone or an autograph, I simply put additional cement there, put two screws as rebar, and built that posterior medial area up. With cement. With cement. So now you, this is a constrained knee. This is a TC3 or so stabilized this, plus? This is a stabilized plus for all intents and functions as a so stabilized a plus. So it's more constrained than a TC3. There's slightly more constraint, and you could argue we should have used femoral and or tibial stems. But given the limitations here, I think the concern was on the tibial side. She's low demand, and to avoid osteotomy, custom stems, all these other things, I thought she would do quite well with this, particularly, most importantly, getting her well aligned and well balanced, which she was. We potentially could have gotten away with a PS plus, but with the, or just a PS, but with the previous surgery, I felt more confident with this construct. But you would agree, in a standard patient, you would recommend using stems when you're using constraint? Yes, if I use constraint in 99% of cases, besides this one, they would have a stem on the tibia in consideration to stem on the femur as well. Does everybody in the panel agree with that recommendation? Perfect. So there's uh, any questions from the audience or any comments? Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Go to the mic. Okay. So the so the what about the soft tissues and the surgical approach? Yeah, that's there's, that's a good question. So the question is, what is the approach? I think uh, basic principles are important, so you want to use the lateral most based incision. If you're going to cross incisions, you want to cross it 90 degrees. You see that this is an S-type incision. That's not my standard incision. I was able to integrate a proximal incision, a mid-portion incision, and then cross a transverse incision at 90 degrees, as you'll, you'll be able to see in a couple more slides forward. So that's why there's an S-type incision to kind of use a lateral base Morris incision right here incorporate the two proximal ones and then come at 90 degrees to the other incision. In regards to uh, the exposure below that, I did a standard media peripatellar arthrotomy. That's what I'm most, most comfortable with. I think your difficult cases are not the cases that you want to switch your approaches on. Those are actually the cases you want to use what you're most comfortable with, and that's what I do for all my cases. 
I have a question for you in this case. If you take a look to the mechanical axis in this case, it is restored for sure. But I'd like to ask you if you have any concern about the uh, stress concentration on the lateral uh, t proximal tibia. Because this calls to my attention that it's a lot of concentration in the lateral tibial cortex in this case. I'm sure I'm convinced that the whole mechanical axis is perfect, but my concerns are related to the tibial component in that position. What would you say? It's yes. only for, for a, a debate. Yeah, yeah. For debate purposes, there's a, you know, I think one of the important keys and the reason I brought this case is that surgery is pros and cons. And so certainly there are cons on not having more support in the metaphysis or a stem with a custom component. But in balancing this patient's soft tissue, her risk of infection, her risk of healing, and the bone quality at the time of surgery, which I should have put an interoperative picture, I thought it was quite appropriate for this type of fixation. We had circumferential cortical coverage of the bone. Uh, so we felt quite comfortable with that, except for that posterior area which we buttress with the two screws and the cement. Question for you would be, for such particular case, if you go for a primary knee without any sort of a stem, it, it would not be worth to, uh, to add a percutaneous lateral tibial plate in order to have a sort of buttress on the lateral side of the tibia and protect this tibia. This is only a question about how to, to protect the lateral uh, cortex of the tibia in this case, especially if the patient is getting older and it's getting a high concentration of the stress in this area. This is only for my knowledge. Yeah, I, uh, you know, with the multiple previous surgeries, I prefer to stay away from stripping that lateral bone for the blood supply. But it would be percutaneous in this case. You could slide the plate uh, because you have the access to the proximal tibia and the distal fixation could be percutaneous one. It's only for my, my reflections. Yeah. yeah, it could. I, I don't have experience with this. Yeah. But I can tell you that this was well fixed and well aligned and we felt comfortable that this low demand gal okay. would get several decades out of this. Okay. Thank you. Great. So we've got five minutes for I'll show you some other cases and maybe one. Let me just see this one here. Uh, let me just find. Okay, so this is just to, to discuss some of the monitoring of infected knees. So this is a 50-year-old woman who has had rheumatoid arthritis for 15 years. She was on methotrexate and Enbro, which is a biologic had a told me in 2002, did well until August 2014 when she presented with sudden pain and swelling. Clearly she had an infection in her knee. She, it was a hematogenous sudden infection. She had been doing very, very well. Here are her x-rays. So there's no question that it's infected uh, and it was MRSA. The surgery was done by another surgeon and she presented actually to another hospital. So how many of you, knowing this history, what would you do for her at this time with this acute hematogenous infection? How much from when the symptoms started? How many days? One or two days. One it was like days. really sudden. She hadn't been lingering for weeks. No, the MRSA was discovered at the time of surgery but I'm not going there. I just want to see how you would manage it. Okay. So, so very basic, we published on this. You know, this is an acute hematologist infection. The x-rays show well-fixed implants. The implant was working well. We would back ourselves with at least one good operation to do an open debridement, senior surgeon, good support, do a synovectomy, take out the poly, change the poly, clean up everything, intravenous antibiotics, and monitor. Okay. And, you know, that, that gives you, you know, it, it depends on whose data you believe, but in our data, that's a 70% chance of controlling that infection. And rather interestingly, our MRSA experience is not the same as the Parvizi experience in that the MRSA, even if you knew it was MRSA, wouldn't stop us from doing and, that. And that's why I mentioned the MRSA, because there's very conflicting data. Even the whole concept of the Bridminton component retention in some parts of the U.S. is now being seen as a no operation, should not be done. You know, I think tender bridements and arthroscopic right. cleanouts shouldn't be done, but I think a good radical debridement by someone who knows what they're doing is a good operation 
I in think this case. The, the negativism in the papers which came out from the U.S., the multi-centers, where unfortunately uh, papers where you could not find what's actually the origin of the microorganism and the type of antibiotics. Eh? So I think in our clinic, also with the Amarose, it's somewhere between 70 and 75 percent. And it's purely because if you really debride, take the poly out, synovectomy, and the other thing we do is look at the, at the medicine, medication from the rheumatologist because you need to think about this metotrexate and Embrel because if you leave them on that, it's, it's, it's also a higher risk. Okay, so she had the debridement, she had MRSA, and she was treated with uh, six weeks of IV vancomycin, and she was given rifampin for six weeks uh, as well. She was not improved. She was switched to oral doxycycline and rifampin, not better. But by now, she has a draining sinus, and that's when I got the call. In the middle of the I think you, uh, you think you I'm sorry? In the middle of the patellar tendon. Right in the middle of the patellar tendon. So there was a draining sinus right through the middle of the patellar tendon. But the patellar tendon was intact. So what would you do, Ferris? So at, at this point, you've got a patient who's already had an MRSA infection who's worse or certainly no better and who's been multiply medicated. So actually, we would stop their antibiotics for at least two weeks and we would rebiopsy because often these become polymicrobial so you need to know your enemy. This is someone who's not going to get better with antibiotics, with observation, with washouts. They're going to need a, probably a staged revision, but what you need to know is understand your enemy first. So stop the antibiotics and get some cultures at least two weeks later. That happened MRSA still. Okay. So Two-stage. I think in the current thinking is with MRSA, someone who's failed recent surgery who's not a good host because she's a rheumatoid on drugs, I, I would do a two-stage. I think it, it, it is uh, your highest chance of a successful outcome. And also it's dangerous to keep a mom with a, uh, with a uh, leaking uh, sinus eh, because it will definitely improve the chances of getting an unsensitive uh, germ on rifampicin. Eh? I still wonder about the MRSA because um, MRSA that comes from a hematogenous infection is, is not all that frequent. Now, she has rheumatoid, and we, we have published and shown that, in, at least in our, in our series, all these uh, infected knees, they just don't do well with the one stage, and, and, and they certainly do not do well with the, uh, just the debridement. So uh, in our area, what we would have done probably is to do the debridement, give her a chance. If it doesn't work, take the whole thing out, put it in the spacer, if you believe in spacers, and then go back and do a two-stage. So, But the MRSA does pose a problem in our practice. If it had been a streptococcus, I would agree completely. It is easy to treat. Yeah, yeah. But MRSA, where does it come from? I think, but in, in reality, you've still got a patient who had a well-functioning knee replacement, and they present acutely. It's very difficult to sell them a two-stage. Uh, you know, I, th I think you lose very little by doing an adequate de debridement. The problem is if, you know, if you do a little cut or you do an arthroscopy, that's when the problem happens. But the trick, as Ferris said, is to do it once and only once, and don't do multiple repeat debridements. I'd like to ask you something. How many of your cultures are false negative? I mean, you know that it is really infected, but you cannot get any, any micro from your cultures. I mean, I've seen this many times, even in patients that are not getting any antibiotics, and then you don't have a clue about what is going on. How do you deal with it? Sure, I mean, that's, that's a big problem. Uh, I alluded to that in that the cases where we have no organism automatically go in our heads into the more complicated case. You know it's infected. We could argue about the criteria and whose criteria you use. I, I've written on this quite a bit and don't necessarily agree with the dogma, but if you know it's infected and don't have an organism, then you have to work a little bit harder with your microbiologist. That's, we have a big team that works with us because the yield goes up if you do a biopsy as well as an aspirate, if you have a team that looks at it for more than a week, looks at it for two weeks, if you add PCR, if you, uh, you know, just look at it in every detail. Uh, ultimately, if you do that, less than 10% of our cases, we don't have an organism. 
So some series are up to about 20. We're now down to less than 10. I don't know. The Mayo guys may be better. I'm not sure. So I decided to do a two-stage. The bride at the sinus was able to close it, did not need a flap. The patella tendon remained intact. And these are her x-rays, the Hoffman technique, except we, we don't recycle the components anymore because we're not allowed to flash implants, so we use brand new implants. And the way I stabilize the poly, I make multiple drill holes in the poly and I cement it in to stabilize it temporarily so that it doesn't spit out. So I saw her at six weeks. She was doing great with that knee. She had completed six weeks of IV Vanco. However, her CRP was hovering through, dur during her treatment at about 50, and now it's 67. Her knee is doing clinically very well. She has no pain. In fact, she started complaining about her other knee now. I, I presume you still off all the drugs. Correct. So, so her rheumatoid, and that's the question, hasn't flared in other joints, but she's complaining of pain in the other knee, which does not look infected, and the x-rays continue to, to look pretty good. So this is a question here with the rheumatoid, even though... There's been a paper from Craig Della Valley that looked at infected knees and showed that the CRP is the same whether you're rheumatoid or non-rheumatoid. I suspect it's because those are treated rheumatoids. But once you take the rheumatoids, the treated rheumatoids, and you, don't, you're, you withdraw treatment, the CRP is going to change. So how are you going to be able to tell the, when to reimplant her? And would you, would you extend the antibiotic therapy and for how long? I would, not, I would not bother too much on the CRP. If you're a rheumatoid and you're on the and umbrella, you probably will always have a raised CRP or ESR. So the question is more or less if you have a difficult to treat microorganism, you more or less either you go back eh, and do an arthroscopy and biopsies or do a second stage, eh, just go in, debride it again, change the, uh, the spacer and look at the cultures. If they're negative, you reimplant, or you go in and extend the antibiotics after surgery and do a one-stage so-called, if the, if the cultures are positive, you have to, to extend the antibiotic period after that. So I think you need to check the other knee is not infected. Right. That's the first thing, uh, because metachronous sepsis is common in these patients. They are very poor host. And, you know, this is just the case where we would definitely have an antibiotic window. So we would stop the antibiotics and then look at the response over a two to four week time frame and a very low threshold for rebiopsy uh, on the basis of knowing what's going on. Yeah, so I, I agree. That's exactly what I do is at six weeks, I would do nothing. I'd stop the antibiotics. I'd see her back in three weeks with our infectious disease specialist, repeat ESR, CRP. At that time, you can consider a repeat biopsy. If she continues to do well, I would see her three weeks after that with another ESR, CRP, and see how they're trending. So I think this is where the trend of the labs as opposed to the absolute numbers start playing a role. Great. This case isn't over, so I can't tell you what we did. <laughs> but I just wanted to bring up some of these points that Ferris and I made about you know, the, the bad host, the MRSA, one stage versus two stage, uh, the Bradman for acute infections, what are the thoughts on the Bradman? So I think we're supposed to finish at 12 o'clock. Is that correct? Let's finish this case. Yeah, th this case is finished. Uh, I've got lots more if you want, but we're supposed to finish at 12, and then we'll reconvene at 2. Thanks very much to the panel for excellent discussion, and thanks for you for sticking around.